Okay, welcome back in. Everyone doing all right? Eddie's all right. Thanks, Eddie. That's good. Everyone else? Yeah. Both of them are fine. Are we in the house? Are we ready? Grab a seat, you guys. Um, it's, uh, it's weird, isn't it? When you become a parent, there's a bunch of jobs that you take on that you know you're going to be taking on. And there's a bunch of things that you just don't know when you have children, right? You do know them before you have children and often willing to give advice. But when you've had the children, you become aware that were the things you just didn't know. And one of those things is you instantly become health and safety officer in your home. And uh, we've got this awesome card that we got once that said, I've child-proofed my home, but they still get in, <laughs> which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> and, um, but they give, there are gadgets, aren't there, that people buy for like home safety. Uh, I don't know if you know, you know those little white plug things? They put them in plug sockets all around the house to stop little fingers going in. The thing is, it's fine if you've got nails and you want to use the plug, but if you don't and you've just got stubby fat fingers, you end up clawing at the thing like a wild kitten with a tapestry, just trying to get into it. And the irony wasn't lost on me when I dug one out with a fork. Um, <clears throat> and then those, those stair gate things, which I always thought would be brilliant as a Krypton factor. Who remembers the Krypton factor? It was brilliant, wasn't it? Or the Christian way. Those stairgate things, if you haven't got kids, it's just flipping nightmare. It's like you've got to tap it in three different places and say Alakazam, and the thing opens. Um, but we get all these safety... The, the last safety thing, which I thought was hilarious, was the, um, with the little clips you get on kitchen cabinets. You know, you kind of pull the cabinet open, and you're really disappointed because it doesn't open all the way. Uh, I was always very disappointed. And my, you know, some people think they're to stop kids getting into the medicine cabinet or the cleaning products. Um, but my parents said it just cut their food bill in half, <laughs> which I have no idea why, why that is. Um, we, we spend a good, time, uh, a good amount of time as parents mitigating risk. And part of mitigating risk is actually making value judgments. It's saying, I would prefer to spend 20 minutes clawing at a plug thing than for an accident to happen. We did this in our house. We child-proofed it. And then uh, Ike found out at the age of four that he could climb up his radiator and onto the Velux window and out of the Velux window and surf the roof. <laughs> actually happened. And we're like ran up there and grabbed him and pulled him back in. I oh, like scared. We try and infuse our kids with the information they need, the best information, if you like, to set them on the path of understanding value. We have a set of inherent values, and we set them on that path. Last week, I was in, uh, in Bournemouth, and... We went to see my grandpa, who's 96. Whenever I'm in the UK, I try and get and see grandpa. He's awesome. And he tells a story, and I'm going to be a bit self-indulgent and show you a video. I secretly videoed him, okay? And then afterwards, I asked for his permission, so you don't have to worry. And I secretly video him starting a story, a story that started by him saying, we got a visit the other day from the thundering occupational therapist, right? And I knew it was going to be a cracker when he went into it. So just check out this video of Grandpa. That one. Thundering the, the occupational therapist rang the other day. Oh, Mr. Arnold, I'd like to come and see you. So I said, OK. Mm -hmm. And she comes. So yeah, we're walking with that. So, yeah, walking with that. And um, she said, oh, your, daughter, your, daughter, your daughter said, you go down the steps out trying to say, yeah, that's right. So she said, well, you show me. So I went, well, I need some shoes, socks on and some shoes. So 
I, I, and she got one of these three wheeler things, you know, that old people have. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, get down the steps and I, I, I chop round with, with this thing and I noticed all the time she'd got her hands you know, on the waist. I said, oh, that's marvellous, yeah. I wonder if we could park it here. I could get it round to the garage to get my scooter out. So, never said it got in. Well, then she said, uh, oh, she said, sit down. I said, oh, before I sit down. So she said, where are you going? I said, well, open the door there. And I got out. And I held the chair and moved over to the rails, walked round there, got back in. And then she said, well, you mustn't do that on your own. And you mustn't go down the steps on your own. So she said, class, you as a high-risk patient. So I said, well, look, life's a risk. I want to go out. I'm going out. <laughs> she said, well, you might fall over. I said, well, I might not. <laughs> yeah. So that's the end of the matter, you know. Oh, you got to love Rip. So there's Gramps at the opposite end of the spectrum, as he well knows, and we all know. And he's making risk assessments, and he's making value judgments. And what he's saying is, I want to mitigate the risk of being stuck indoors by taking the risk of falling over to the thundering occupational therapist. President company accepted. I'm sure you're all marvellous. Um, you are. You do an important job. Um, so he was angry, and he was like, well, you know, I love some of what he said as well. I keep watching it and thinking it's hilarious every single time. She put her hands on my waist and I said, well, that's marvellous. <laughs> Brilliant. Anyway. <clears throat> so we make value judgments. And sometimes we don't even articulate those judgments. We just live them. You know, what is your highest priority? What is your highest priority? Our kids will pick up, they're like sponges for our value system, the unarticulated value system. Sometimes we articulate something, but we live something different. I've certainly done that as a parent. There are times when I articulate something, but actually my response is something different. I'm a flawed parent, like the rest of us. If you're a parent, you're flawed. Not present company accepted. So we make decisions like we want financial st stability or we want, we want this or we want that. And they're good things. We want the best education. You hear parents say that. I want the best education. I want my children to want for nothing. Have you ever heard someone say that? I want my children to want for nothing. That's an odd value, isn't it? But sometimes we live these values. And part of what we're doing here today is we are making a statement about a value system, we're articulating something of a foundation in our lives. So it's a bit of a weird thing, isn't it, to be invited to a dedication? You come along, and it's, what are we actually dedicating ourselves to? I've said, yes, we're dedicating ourselves to, be, to have Jesus as our foundation. You're like, that's brilliant. You're not even a building, and Jesus is your foundation. It just doesn't make any practical sense. So I'm going to do a little bit of work with you to try and help you understand how we see Jesus as our foundation and why would we want to stand up and go, we're dedicated to that. We're dedicated uh, to that. <clears throat> so remember at the beginning I said there are three things we're doing here. We're grateful. Fundamentally, we're grateful. Uh, there's a song that says, we are breathing the breath that he gave us to breathe to worship him. It, it's a brilliant one because it's foundational, right? Some of the values we have, they're on, what is it, Maslow's hierarchy of needs? The, you know, the shelter, food, like 
company, I don't know, other things. Um, but some of our values, they're kind of on that. They're good things. They're not bad things. But I want to make a case here for a value system that actually overrides all of it. And it becomes the very foundation that we're standing on. The other two things we're saying, we're dedicating our parents uh, to, to being parents who lay a foundation of Jesus. Who say, we live with Jesus as foundation. And we're dedicating as a, as a church uh, to actually live like that as well. I want to read you a little scripture from Matthew 6. It's a really interesting one about value. <laughs> it's from, and Jesus is saying these words. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body or what you'll wear. Is not life more than food? Or the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap. All store away in barns, and yet uh, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed as one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, then is thrown in the fire. Will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith, he says. Do not worry, saying, what should we eat or what should we drink or what should we wear? For the pagans run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Okay? (coughs) Classically, we do worry about these things, don't we? We do worry about those things. But there's an actual explicit promise here from God. If you seek first the kingdom of God, I'll put these other things where they belong, which is in a list of provisions from the king. And so that is the first level of this. uh, Making Jesus the foundation is saying, I'm not going to... I'm not going to get caught up with what's right in front of me as a need. I'm going to focus on seeking first the kingdom of God. Now that sounds like a really, it's still ethereal, isn't it? Still like, well, how do you do that? And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about six weeks into my marriage, where Mary and I, the first six weeks, uh, felt like walking through a, a field made of treacle and being shot at. It was really, really difficult. We honestly, we, it's like we hadn't been t- together for like a year and a half. She'd been doing a PGCE, working hard. And then we got married and then we were together. And that first six weeks, we just went clash. And we were like, dude, it shouldn't be like this. And we, we kind of got, we found over six weeks, we actually entrenched ourselves in opposing positions. And we were arguing and struggling, and it culminated at a point where she was sat in the car, ready to drive to the airport to go back to England, and I was sat in the house, willing to bring her the keys. (laughs) And it was was tough. It was really, really tough. And what we did was we came to a point of realisation that actually this marriage isn't just about us. And we remembered a conversation we'd had some time before where we said, we want our marriage to be centered on who Jesus is. Oh, you know. And then the reality of the six-week slap around the face hit. And so it had to become a reality. The foundation thing had to become a reality. So we got together in the lounge. And we said, we said we'd make Jesus the foundation of this marriage. How do we do that? So the first thing we did was we looked at what Jesus says. And Matthew, Matthew 5 to 7 is a really good place to start. If you ever want to read something of what Jesus has said, Matthew 5 to 7 will blow your mind. And it did for us in our marriage. I read it for three months solid afterwards because some of the things that are said are just so precious when you feel like your enemies. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, for both of us, we were like, oh, that's you. I'm <laughs> right here. But actually, entrenchment 
is impossible when Jesus is foundation. You've got to take your eyes off of the immediate thing and put it on to Jesus. We found ourselves in a position where the immediate issues were blinding us to our immediate need. The immediate issues were blinding us to our immediate need. And so what we did was we said, Jesus is foundation. The first thing is obvious. He says, love enemies. So Jesus' MO, his mandate, his way to live, his founda- the foundational nature of who Jesus is, is love. What does the Bible say about love? So we went to 1 Corinthians 13, which is read at virtually every wedding. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. Incredible poetic words. But I want you to listen to them for a second. Love is patient. Mm. Love is kind. Mm. I don't know. Whenever I hear that scripture, I just hear like a vicar who's about 68, who's very, very posh, saying them. It's it's definitely one of those, love is patient. Love is kind. And when you're six weeks into a treacle-filled marriage, hearing that voice saying those words, goes right through you like woolen gloves. But actually, it's poignant. Because you have to say, we're going to make... Jesus the foundation. We're going to recognize our immediate need and take our eyes sometimes off the issue that's facing us. When we worked out Jesus was the foundation, we took on that advice. We started to take on that advice and started to just work hour by hour, day by day, to kind of hold back some of the stuff that was we were entrenched in or fighting about or kind of wrestling about and actually come back to the foundation. And we're married, we're married 21 years now in August. And that's not saying we have a perfect marriage. We don't. It's flawed. It's difficult sometimes. But I want you to understand that actually when we use Jesus as the, the plumb line, any builders in the house today? Okay, the plumb line is like this line that's meant to be perfectly straight, right, from... And if you can build up next to it. And if you build next to it and you build straight, it's going to be good. And if you don't, sometimes it's just a bit skewed and a bit rubbish. And so we were saying, right, we're going to build. You're not my standard. Other people aren't my standard. There's no, co- there's no comparisons. Jesus is our standard. We're going to build in line with him. And that is what has made us come through in our marriage when we both feel entrenched, because both of us decided to do that and make that the foundation. So that's kind of, I just want you to understand, what does it look like to make Jesus' foundation? (laughs) And that's it for me. Now, you might ask, well, why, uh, why would I do that in my life? Why would I make Jesus the foundation of my life, and I want to read another scripture from Matthew, uh, to you from Matthew seven, verse twenty-four to twenty-seven. It says this: Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew, and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation. On the rock, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came, the streams rose, the wind blew, beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Anyone ever been in a situation where you're asking the question, what next? You just... You, hey, listen, there's some inevitability in life, isn't there? Put your hand up if you've had a life with no storms, no rising streams, no wind, just perfect surfing conditions all the time. They don't exist, those lives. Life is full of storms. Jesus never promised us a life free from storms. What he promised us was that he would be A foundation that is immovable. It is a rock. 
on which we can stand. I've got one more story for you. And it's a story about May the 14th, 2016. May the 14th, 2016, at five o'clock, I woke up and my chest was clamping down and I was having a heart attack. And it was a moment in my life where, as I stood in front of the mirror, all the other values and things that were important to me just fell away because instantly I'm faced with my own fragile mortality. I'm looking in the mirror. My face is literally draining of blood in front of me. And at that moment, what happened for me was that I was instantly filled with an amazing sense of just tranquility. And I said, Jesus, I'm coming to be with you permanently. Then I said something else that was, I said, and please don't let me bleed, um, because I don't want to be in a mess for Mary. It's weird, isn't it? But the values and priorities in that moment fell away. The only value, the only foundation, the only system, the only person in that moment, apart from uh, Mary's cleanly cleanup, the only thing that mattered was the fact that Jesus was the rock on which my life was built. Now, let me tell you this. If you'd have asked me a week before, what would, what would you be like in that moment? I would have been like, no idea. I'm actually quite grateful to God for the experience. Because what it enabled me to see was, whatever happens, whatever storms come, actually, when push comes to shove, the rubber hits the road, Jesus is with me. And he's the foundation on which I stand. What an incredible thing. You know, we commit to tell our children the most important information, don't we? Ike, don't crawl into the Arga. It's not going to be good. Um, you know, don't jump off that. It's 15 foot high. Uh, you know, you, 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 you tell your kids important information. I, right, boys, make sure you work hard at school because one day you're going to look back and go, I'm glad I did that. Okay? Delayed gratification. We, we try and give them the most important information. What are we doing here today with dedications? We're not ticking a box a religious box, a parental expectation, uh, a mini dance that we do. We're not doing that. What we're saying is we dedicate ourselves because we're grateful to God for the gift of our children to share with them the most fundamental information about their purpose, about their identity, about the rock on which they stand. Because no wind or storm or stream or rising flood can break down the foundation of the house that's built upon the rock. And that rock, his name is Jesus. And only Jesus. Jesus says an interesting thing. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He made that claim of himself. I urge you to look at who Jesus is. I urge you to read who Jesus is. I urge you to read how he subverted the powers of the day and how he breathed love as a mandate. How he loved those on the out, um, on the out, who were outcasts, those on the margins. I urge you to see the foundation upon which we live our lives and upon which Freedom Church is built because Jesus is the head of this church. No man, Jesus is the head of this church. And so I want to offer you an opportunity today, whoever you are, to actually just respond by saying, I want to make Jesus the foundation, if that's what you want to do. And I'm just going to ask us to close our eyes. I'm going to pray um, really quickly for everyone. Father God, I thank you so much that, um, that my experience, that for many of us here, our experience, is that Lord Jesus, you are the foundation that cannot be moved and actually, that we, when we base our lives on you, in you, when we hear your words, and we do them, when you walk alongside us, uh, whatever storms come, Lord, we know that you're with us and that you see us through. And Lord, I want to pray in the context of what we're doing today, that we'd be able to not just say, but show that to our children. 
to our young people, uh, to those around us, actually, what it's like to live for you. And, um, and then I just want to do one more thing while we've all got our eyes closed and, and just uh, invite you, if, if like some of what's been happening today has grabbed you and actually you want to say, I want to make Jesus my foundation, I'm going to pray a really simple prayer. Um, and I'm going to pray this prayer and you're welcome to just join in with me uh, quietly under your breath. Lord Jesus, I want to make you the foundation of my life. I'm sorry where I've actually built my life on other stuff and I've actually found it to be weak. I want to base my life on you and I want to receive you into my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Just keep your eyes closed. If you've said that prayer, I just want you to lift your hand because I want the opportunity to be able to chat with you afterwards or you can come and see me at the front here. I'm going to be ready to pray for people. Because let me tell you right now, there's no other decision that you will ever make that compares to the one where you say, my life is in you, Jesus. No other decision. Worship you, Lord.